Hey everyone, this is Kenji Lopez Alta. I'm back in my kitchen today. Um, today I'm making another Roman pasta dish, um, uh, Bucatini alla Matriciana. Um, and I'm also gonna make a little uh, arugula salad because so far this has just been a big cheese and carb fest. Um, here we go. So, Bucatini alla Matriciana was named after the town of Amatrice, maybe I'm pronouncing that wrong, I hope I'm not. Um, but for all intents and purposes, it's really a Roman pasta dish these days. Um, it's one of the classic Roman dishes, you know, the other ones being carbonara, um, <clears throat> uh, allegria, allegria, and um, uh, cacio e pepe. Um, we start, well, this is this is uh, some actually some bacon. Um, it's more similar to pancetta, actually, that my sous chef Eric made. Um, traditionally, you would make this with guanciale, which is cured pork jowl, um, as opposed to um, bacon, which is cured pork belly, or pancetta, which is cured pork belly. Um, but all I have is pancetta. Um, I don't have guanciale, and it works just fine. You can also just, if you really want, you can just use regular old American bacon. Um, you know, the smokiness and the sweetness of that are not quite right for the dish, but it's still something that comes out delicious. Um, I'm cutting nice, kind of nice, thick lardons here, um, because I like a little bit of texture to it. Now, these are going to go to a pan here. A little bit of olive oil. Pancetta. Now, there's a lot of debate about um, how this dish is made, even, um, you know, even among traditionalists, um, whether, uh, you know, some people say add garlic and onions, some people say that completely ruins the dish. Um, I do it pretty simply. I use olive oil, uh, guanciale, black pepper, red pepper flakes, tomatoes, and of course, uh, Pecorino Romano cheese, which is from Lazio, not from, um, I don't know why I thought it was from Emilia Romagna last time I said it. I, I, um, when I was making my Cacio Pepe video, you know, I, I flubbed it when I was on the spot. Um, let me wash my hands actually. So we're about to make a salad. Everyone washing their hands properly. In the backs, getting your fingertips, in between your fingers. Getting your thumbs. People forget their thumbs a lot. What I tell my daughter to do is make uh, soap gloves. You want to cover your whole hands with soap. Every surface. Um, oh, I'm going to get that pasta going as well. Uh, as I did with my Cacio e Pepe video, I'm going to start this one. Um, I'm going to cook the pasta bucatini in a um, in a wide, shallow skillet um, rather than a sort of tall pasta pot. Um, the reason being that you want really concentrated starch uh, in the pasta water to get the dish to um, you know to get the sauce to really cling to the pasta. There you go. Get that going. I love these. Wooden, uh, I don't know what you call them, spatula thing. They're made by this company called Early Wood. All hardwood, they make really beautiful tools. Um, this is one of my favorites. A little bit of salt. All right, now I'm gonna get going on uh, the salad. Um, my, I don't know if they watch this. I don't know if my neighbors, Emily and Brian, I don't know if you guys watch this channel, but um, this is from their garden. Uh, some nice arugula, beautiful arugula that we just went and snipped, so thank you guys. I'm gonna give it a quick wash. It was pretty clean to begin with, so I don't really need to do too much to it. Very important that you get your salad greens nice and dry. Otherwise the dressing just runs off of them. This uh, salad spinner is from OXO. Uh, they make it in a couple sizes. Um, it's my favorite salad spinner. Um, again, by the way, I never do product placement ever. Like, no, I don't do any kind of paid advertising, any kind of paid product placement. So if I tell you I like something, it's because I like it, not because someone's paying me to say that. Um, um, got a cucumber that's a little bit past its prime, so we'll just use it up. Eh, do we leave the skin on or take it off today? Um, at least it does not like the skin, so let's take the skin off. 
Um, I'm not going to bother taking out the seeds because Alicia likes to eat the seeds. But you could, you know, if you want to, if I was serving this at a restaurant, I would probably take out the seeds because a little watery. Alright. Set the rendering. Look at that. Beautiful. Nice and, nice and low and slow, we're gonna go. What else goes into the salad? We'll do some, oh well, we'll make a vinaigrette. That's what we'll do. We got a shallot here. One thing I learned from Jack Pepin um, in person, in fact, was that he feels people don't take enough of the sh the outer shell, um, the outer peels, outer layers of shallots and onions off, because um, those outer shells are sometimes a little dry and they can be a little more strongly flavored than you want. Um, so I have learned to start being a little bit more generous with the amount of um, layers I take off of that shallot. Just a little rough. Doesn't have to be too precise. That's probably enough for one salad, I think. What else? Well, we got this pecorino out. Might as well just use some of it in the, uh, in the salad as well. Do some in the dressing here. A bit. Uh, so. These are lemons from our backyard. Now what are we gonna do? We're gonna put this on a slowly and whisk in some olive oil. It's probably not gonna be a super tight emulsion. That's okay. Now the reason the reason an emulsion is important in a salad is because first of all it helps the um, it helps the vinegar um, or in this case the lemon juice you know whatever the acid is it helps it stick to the leaves so that it doesn't all just drain to the bottom of the bowl. Um, it also um, helps protect the leaves from the effects of the oil. Um, actually, let me show you something. Here's um I've, I've done this demo. There's there's a demo of this in my book. So here's two. Um, arugula leaves, super fresh. Um, I'm gonna put, a lot of people think it's the acid in a salad that um, uh, that will cause the greens to go limp, um, but it's not, it's actually the oil, so I'll show you. I'm gonna put some acid on there, lemon juice, all over it, okay? Just like that, and then this other one, I'm gonna take just a little bit of olive oil. Okay, all over that one. And now we'll just, we'll put these, here, let's put these aside here. And we'll come back to them in a few minutes and see what happens, okay? I'm doing a little impromptu science. All right, that's all ready to go. Let's get our tomatoes. These ones are actual DOP tomatoes, San Marzano's. Get our bucatini in the water. Um, oh, this is that brand of pasta I was showing you the other day. I didn't realize, but it's actually just the... Um, it's it's signature reserve. It's the Safeway brand, uh, like their fancy brand, um, and it's actually really good. Brass die extruded. You can see the nice white texture. You can see the texture on it. Um, I don't know if you can see, it, but I can see the texture on it. I'm telling you, it's there. It's beautiful, um, and that um, is what helps the pasta stick. It's what creates the starch of your pasta water. Um, it helps the sauce stick. Excuse me. Um, it helps emulsify the sauce properly. All right, so we're gonna get that in the water. here. Now, some people just add black pepper at the very end. That's a little bit too much fat in there. With the, that's very fatty pancetta. I'm going to just drain a little bit of it off. Save that for another use. A toasted grilled cheese in it, maybe. Maybe tonight. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll post one of those videos tonight. Black pepper. I'm gonna put, I like putting some in uh, with the oil to kind of bloom it and get it a little bit sweeter and infuse the oil with the flavor. Um, 
And then I'm also gonna add a little bit at the very end just for that kind of, kind of fresh hit of heat. Um, just a little bit of pepper flakes, not a lot. Toast it up a little. All right. We got our San Marzano tomatoes. You don't have to use San Marzano's, but I am. Uh, and again, I'm gonna go in with this, my, one of my favorite tools. I use this, you know, this is great for if you're making like, um, if you're browning sausage and you wanna crumble it for a sauce, or if you're, you know, you're making ground meat chili or like, you know, American, you know, Mexican American style uh, Tex-Mex tacos with uh, like a ground beef filling. This is really, this tool is really great for breaking up things that are simmering or sauteing in a pan. Um, don't use it in your non-stick because it will scratch it, but uh, against steel and enamel like this, as long as you're kind of relatively gentle with it, works real well. A little bit of salt. All right, now we're gonna let that simmer. This is a sort of a quick pan sauce. Um, some people, um, I know Daniel, Daniel Gritzer, uh, my colleague at Serious Eats, um, on his recipe for this, he does it a simple way, but he's, uh, in the story for it, he talks about how he worked at a, um, a Tuscan restaurant in New York. He was a sous chef there, um, and they made their uh, Amatriciana sauce um, with onions and garlic, and they cooked it down for a long time, which is a very untraditional method. But you know, again, with all these things, you do it how you want. You do what tastes good to you. Um, some people might complain that you know if you change, if you change the base recipe, you are now changing. You know you're changing it, so you should no longer call it um, amatriciana. Um, I'm not really that much of a prescriptivist with language because I think um, you know the point of language is to communicate. So if it makes it easier for someone to understand what you're making by saying I'm making amatriciana, um, then you do that. And you know maybe it depends on your audience. Like with a um, you know if you're talking to a uh, an American audience, they're probably going to understand it better if you call it Amatriciana, even if it's not traditional Amatriciana. Whereas if you're talking to a, a Roman audience, they might get more confused if you start calling something Amatriciana when it's, um, when it's not traditional at all, you know? Um, so, you know, know your, know your audience and, and just relax about it all, you know? It doesn't really matter too much. Oh, you know what I said I would do? I said I would go through comments and answer, answer some questions next time. Uh, oh, can you explain why a hot, why adding water to a hot pan would ruin it. Um, in a couple of my videos, um, I've kind of, and I sometimes do this, like I, I'll take a hot pan and I run it directly under cold water. Um, it's not a good idea because the shock, the thermal shock um, can cause the pan to warp. Um, so if it's a thinner pan, um, especially it'll cause it to warp. Um, or if it's um, like a clad pan, like a tri-ply steel with sandwich with aluminum or sandwich with copper, tri-ply pans will tend to, um, the layers can separate from each other because the metals um, expand and contract at different rates. And especially if you pour cold water on a hot, on a hot pan, that outer layer of metal is gonna really qu rapidly contract and that can cause it to pull away from the inner layer of metal. So generally you do wanna let your pans cool relatively slowly um, rather than shocking them. All right, we got everything going here. Uh, let's see, what else can we add to our salad? Here, we got, uh, we got my daughters. If you're a parent of a toddler, you probably see stuff like this around. Um, we got my daughter's half-eaten apple, so I'm gonna just trim off the bitten parts. This is exactly how we would do it at the restaurant, you know? Just kidding. We would not do this at the restaurant. Different rules for home and work. That in there. What do we got? What do we got? Maybe I don't have any nuts right now. Holy cow, I might have used up all my nuts. Where's my nuts? Uh, there's some hazelnuts. How do they smell? They don't smell fresh. I got no nuts. Oh well. We're not going to do nuts in that case. I'll leave those for someone else to find. I'll leave that for future Kenji to take care of. I don't really like future Kenji, he's a, he's a jerk. All right. Sauce is coming down. 
How's our pasta looking? Just like with the um, cacio e pepe, you want to basically um, cook the pasta to a little bit shy of al dente. Um, so if the you know if the box of the pasta says it's going to cook for 12 minutes, you want to cook it for like 10, um, and then it's going to finish off in the sauce. Maybe I'll add some extra extra cheese to the salad. Some feta, feta, feta cheese. I had been saving that feta cheese because I was going to make um, spanakopita with Alicia. Um, good thing to do with kids, folding dough and you know, one of those things where spanakopita does that, you know, that Greek dish of um, spinach and feta wrapped in phyllo dough and, and baked. Um, it's one of those dishes that even when it looks terrible, like, you know, even if a little kid's clumsy fingers do it or a grown person's clumsy fingers do it, it still uh, tastes good. Um, oh, let's look back at the, at the arugula. So, the one that had lemon juice on it, I don't know if you can see it, but like no bruising really to speak of. Uh, maybe a tiny bit where they, that looks like the leaf kind of folded and crushed some cells there, but no real bruising or limping to, that you can see. Whereas the one with oil, um, so you can see how the oil has started to kind of seep through into these spots like that. Um, and the reason that is is because... Well, first of all, the oil is the oil is what's going to make your leaves, your salad greens go limp. The reason that is is because um, leaves growing out on the trees or growing out on the bushes, um, they have a kind of waxy coating on them, and that's there to protect them from rain. Um, you know, because if if it were so, acid, acids, the culinary acids that we use are mo mostly water, right? It's, um, so if, um, if 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 they didn't have that waxy coating, um, every time it rained all the leaves would go limp and the trees would just fall down. Well, all the leaves would fall off and go limp. Um, so they have this waxy coating and that's what makes droplets of water kind of run off the leaf. Um, and it's also what makes droplets of vinegar or lemon juice run off the salad greens into the bottom of the bowl. Um, meanwhile, um, oils can actually penetrate because they're, um, you know, they're, they're, they're all hydrophilic, um, hydrophobic molecules. So they, they can penetrate and the oils can actually get in there um, and penetrate between the cells. And that's what makes them get that sort of translucent look. And that's what makes them go really limp. Um, uh, and that's also what, make, yeah, what makes your salad greens not last that long. So an emulsion helps both of those things. It helps the vinegar stay on, the, it helps the acid stay on the uh, leaf, and it helps uh, prevent the leaves from going limp as fast. Um, but you know, anyway, you don't want to toss your salad until right before, right before you're ready to serve. Let's see how that pasta is doing. I think we're pretty much there with the pasta. I'm looking close. Oh yeah, we are there. All right. See, that's a little bit, a little bit too much sauce. I'm gonna take some of this out for. That's about right for the amount of pasta we have. Let's still wax on that bench up though. Right. All right. Pasta in. Let's bring it up to a simmer. this off, get a little bit of that pasta water in there. Now we are going to go in with our cheese. Pecorino Romano um, has a really nice sort of, sh it's a sheep's milk cheese aged, a really nice kind of sharp, well, acidic, a little bit kind of peppery flavor. Um, and it's, you know, it is the classic flavor of Rome, um, of these Roman pasta dishes. Um, but of course, if you can't find it, um, or you prefer the flavor of Parmesan, you can definitely go with just some Parmesan. All right, I got that. A little bit of fresh black pepper. I'm gonna try and keep it relatively coarse this time. You could also do it in a um, mortar and pestle if you really want that coarseness, which sometimes I do. Olive oil, some fresh olive oil at the end. Right, you can see how the sauce really nicely kind of coats the pasta. Um, you know, it's very different from like what you would see like in, I don't know, like in your high school cafeteria where you get the, the oiled, oiled pasta, a pile of oiled pasta in your bowl and then 
uh, a ladle of sauce on the top um, and you end up kind of eating plain pasta and plain sauce and it doesn't really it doesn't achieve um, what I think Ed Levine would call cosmic oneness you want that pasta and the sauce to achieve cosmic oneness And let's get a little bit of extra sauce on there. Let's spoon a little bit of that extra, extra sauce around. At least get the chunkies out. You don't have to, it's just, it's just like in a restaurant habit, clean up the edge of the plate. And a little more pecorino. A little more black pepper. All right, we got that. Let's toss our salad. At least you had lunch in like three minutes, all right? Delicious. Steal a bite of that pasta before uh, before I give any of it to Alicia. What do you think? I think it looks pretty good. This is a pretty good looking lunch. Mmm. Mm. One of the nice things about finishing pasta um, in the sauce like this, aside from sort of getting the flavor to really coat it, is that um, it goes into what, um, well, what, again, my colleague Daniel Gritzer calls pasta bullet time, which is where the pasta, the, because you're cooking it in an acidic sauce, um, acid actually slows down the rate of water absorption. Um, and so the pasta takes longer. You have a longer, of window, longer window of time before it passes through that, you know, that al dente phase and starts to turn mushy. Um, so it makes it a little bit more forgiving to finish in the sauce. Um, and of course it makes it more flavorful. That is excellent, if I do say so myself. Mm. All right, thank you. We're gonna have lunch, bye.